welcome back to the Fearless Training Raw Knowledge Podcast, everybody. And today I'm back with another guest, Big Nick from Flex Success, an amazing team. Previously, you might have mentioned I had a conversation with Lizzie Rorda from Flex Success as well. I do apologize about the audio on that one. Just a quick side note on that. I am improving it. I have invested in some better mics, some better equipment. There has been a bit of trial and error. I am learning, so thank you for your patience. Please bear with me. This recording is much better. Nick's sound is absolutely squeaky clean. Mine is a little bit faded. However, you will notice as these episodes continue, the audio is continually getting better as well, and it is at a point now where it will be very professional going forward, in all cases, for your listening pleasure. However, once again, I do appreciate your support. Thank you for all the new subscribers and listeners to the channel. I hope you're enjoying it. The feedback has been really positive as well. Anywho, a bit about my guest this week. So in terms of education, Nick is current formal studying in the MNU Academy. So for those who are not aware, that's a Martin McDonald based academy. Uh, One of the better uh, levels or curriculums out there available to health professionals, in my opinion, which we delve into as well. So if any of you have been wondering about that and a little bit more of the specifics, Nick goes through a little bit more about what's involved. He's a level three personal trainer, a level two strength and conditioning coach, level two powerlifting coach, and level one accredited Australian weightlifting coach. He is an ex-RAF avionics engineer, and he has five plus years of personal training and nutrition coaching experience. So we get into a lot of those little specifics and more about his involvement in sport and rugby, etc., and a lot of how those things correlate over to what he does now for Flex Success. So his coaching specializations include general population, non-athlete coaching, sports performance nutrition, weight cutting optimization for non-physique competitions, and also vegan or vegetarian plant-based approaches, etc., which we get into in this conversation, which I think you'll find is quite interesting, especially for those of you who are more on the plant-based, or perhaps you wanna include more plant-based varieties within your nutrition regimen. And for those of you who are still trying to build strength and a good physique, you might find some of the protocols quite useful and perhaps a little bit of a guide to what Nick does with himself and his own clients too. But all in all, this was a great conversation with a fellow metalhead who likes to lift heavy objects in Germany. And I think you'll find that this one will be the first of many as we have a couple of things planned as me and Nick had a quick chat off the air as well about some exciting projects to share more knowledge with all of you guys going forward too. As always guys, enjoy this conversation this week with Nick Whiteman. All right, big Nick, welcome to the Fearless Training Raw Knowledge Podcast, my friend. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me, mate. Absolutely, my pleasure. So if I'm correct, you are over in Germany at present. How is the weather? What's going on over there? It is bloody boiling. It was like 35 degrees yesterday, um, which I know by Australian standards isn't that bad. Uh, but in Germany, they don't have air conditioning in anywhere but like, you know, office buildings and shopping centers. So they just don't really know how to deal with the heat. Um, their buildings haven't been built to deal with the heat. Um, so yeah, pretty bloody hot. I'm actually kind of looking forward to the winter for once. There you go, there you go. A bit, bit of a juxtaposition, I guess, to most people out here to a degree. Um, Nick, yeah. As always, and perhaps you can tie this in, uh, give us a bit of a background of who you are, what you do, how you got into the role you're in now, and perhaps even how you found yourself in, in Germany and specifically where you are. Yeah, no worries. Um, so, as you've already said, uh, my name is Nick Whiteman. Most people refer to me as Big Nick. Um, and it sounds like a self-imposed nickname, but actually in kindergarten, there were three Nicks and I got called Big Nick then and my whole life since then, um, even my like my immediate family have always called me Big Nick. Um, so that's kind of stuck. And then I was in the Air Force for a while. Obviously, there's a lot of Nicks in there. So again, it just stuck. Like I was the biggest of the Nicks that anyone had had around at the time. So it kind of stuck with me. Um, but how did I end up here and doing what I'm doing? I... Uh, I've played rugby since I was four, so that's 26 years now. Um, 
And when I was about 19 or 20, I got into coaching. Um, doing that rugby coaching, obviously people start, like other players and stuff, start to look up to you and, you know, ask for tips on uh, how to get stronger and faster and et cetera, et cetera. And I found that, you know, the more people asked me, the more information I was giving out and I decided I needed to get some sort of qualification um, so that I was actually giving good information and it wasn't just based on, you know, what I was doing. Because um, as with everybody, unless you go straight into being a PT from school, you probably give out just, you know, this is what I do and it will work for you and you, that's what you think at the start. Um, so, yeah, I became a personal trainer. Um, I kind of was in and out of the industry for a while. Um, as most people know, it's kind of hard to get started. Um, when I moved to the UK, which was well, five years ago now, um, that's what I did for a job. Like I left the Air Force to move over there. So it was kind of the only thing I had outside of being an aviation engineer. So it was, you know, kind of all or nothing. I went all in. Uh, while I was there, you know, spent like three years coaching people and like being a normal in-gym PT. Um, I also did heaps of rugby coaching, um, was playing rugby over there. And then after three years, I ran out of visas. So my next closest place, uh, my girlfriend's British, so um, the next closest place that I could get uh, to stay near England uh, was Germany. It was just the first place they had a rugby team that wanted to give me a contract. And so I got signed, came over to Germany, and I've been here ever since. Um, so basically, um, the big difference from what I did in England to what I do now, um, because obviously I'm in Germany, I don't really speak that much German, so I had to move online. Um, so again, a lot of the online stuff, people don't really want that much technique help online um, or that much like, you know, you can PT for people, but, um, you know, that in-gym PT stuff, like where you just count reps and load plates and stuff doesn't really transfer to online. So I was upskilling. Um, I went and signed up for Mac Nutrition Uni um, and through Mac Nutrition Uni, uh, picking up the qualifications that led me to, you know, being decent at nutrition. Um, and I already had like a fair bit of knowledge, but again, I wanted to get an actual course behind me and actually have something that was recognized in the industry so that I'm not covered because, you know, as you know, nutritionist isn't really um, a protected title, but so that I knew I was giving out good information to people who asked me. And um, that kind of led me along, um, you know, I was following Flex and um, talking to Dean and Lizzie and all the coaches over there fairly regularly um, via social media. And uh, I was actually a Flex client when I was powerlifting um, maybe a year or two ago, no, about two years ago. Um, and yeah, when they were looking for new people, uh, eventually they came to me and were just like, Nick, we might be um, looking for new coaches soon. Are you interested? And obviously I was interested. So it kind of just all you know, snowballed from there. And then before I knew it, I was a flex coach. Right, right. There's quite a few interesting threads I'd like to sort of go into, Nick, from what you said there. Yeah. First of all, uh, you mentioned your time uh, as, as a rugby player and then also as a, was it an aeronautical engineer. Yeah, so it was like depends on where you are in the world. I was an avionics technician or an avionics engineer. Um, yeah, but basically I fixed planes, um, specifically fighter jets when I was in the Air Force. Right, right. That, I mean, that's interesting in and of itself. Um, do you think some of those skills within the avionic industry and playing rugby crossed over to helping you be a better coach? And if so, how did they help you in terms of learning about your body? Perhaps I know usually in the avionic industry, you have really good habits and skills. I have a couple of friends who've been in the Air Force. They're usually really disciplined, and I found that helped them create a lot of um, like a structured regimen. I don't know if that's something that's helped you, but perhaps if there's any principles and takeaways that has helped you and your clients that you could share with us before we move on to other areas next, that'd be great. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the probably the biggest stuff would be for me personally as an athlete and as like myself, like as far as coaching goes, like there's a few things that I picked up um, more, like less from being an avionics tech or avionics engineer um, and more from just being in the Air Force and dealing with people in the way that you have to. Um, 
so dealing with people is one skill that I picked up um, from the Air Force and kind of having a good mix of, you know, having empathy, but also being able to, you know, when you need to talk straight with people and do that in a way that's still respectful um, and still productive, um, but gets the point across. I find like a lot of nutritionists and stuff, uh, they work with people who are a bit difficult and kind of beat around the bush all the time. And never really, like with those sort of people don't really get anywhere. Um, and I find personally that works out a bit better if I can, you know, be a bit more direct with people, set expectations, like get things really moving from the start. Um, so I guess people skills is a funny thing to have picked up from the Air Force and anyone who's been in the military would probably be like, how do you get people skills from that? Um, but it's just something that uh, I personally picked up. Um, as far as my own personal um, journey, I used to be 150 kilos. Um, so the, uh, the highest I ever saw the scale at was like 151 or something like that. Um, and now I'm sitting anywhere between 105 and 110. <clears throat> so the discipline and stuff really came through in my own journey um, and the Air Force sort of helped me with that and even the rugby side sort of helped me with that although being 150 kilos I was still a pretty handy rugby player um, but yeah using those skills and applying them to my um, fitness and weight loss journey has given me an insight into losing large amounts of weight um, which I can then help and apply to clients and to other people which I think is a unique thing in that sort of like the area that flex work in. Like, yeah, we work with a lot of general pop, but we also work with a lot of like high level athletes and competitive athletes and bodybuilders and stuff like that. So we, because we have such a varied range of people we work with, it's good to have like with me, I can understand from a performance point of view because like even now I still play semi-pro rugby um, until I got injured, I was powerlifting at like a German national level. Um, and then I can also empathize with the, you know, weight loss and the feeling like it's never going to end and you're never getting anywhere and trying to find like little tricks that work for you as an individual. So I feel like it puts me in like a unique position having, you know, the rugby, the weight loss, the Air Force background, um, and kind of doing things in an unconventional way that I have. Yeah, great. Makes sense. Quite, quite versatile, and definitely living up to the name Big Nick with with a, a body weight like that. You know, I mean, obviously a big unit. To give some context, Nick, how how tall are you? Uh, I'm six foot four, so 194 centimeters. Yeah, that's a, that's a big yeah. missile. One I'm actually on the pitch. Yeah, especially when I was like at 150, I wasn't that mobile. But around like the 125, 130 mark, I was getting back a little bit of speed. Like, I definitely wouldn't want to step. I probably would have broke my knee or something. But, um, you know, just running at somebody at 130 kilos is pretty hard to stop. Now I have to rely a little bit more on skill rather than just, you know, complete body weight and running into somebody. But, you know, I make do. I'm like the league I play in Germany is the top league. So the next step from there would be to play for Germany, like a national competition, like against other countries and stuff. Sure, sure. Very, very handy indeed on the pitch then, Nick. That's great. And mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, powerlifting. Can we talk a little bit about that in terms of uh, flex success initially coaching you within your powerlifting and a little bit of what you did specifically within the powerlifting, how you got into it, and then once again, what powerlifting has taught and continues to teach you about lifting and perhaps skill acquisition in relation to the more strength-based athletes that you coach? Yeah, definitely. Um, so <clears throat> I'll start with how I got into powerlifting. Um, basically, when I decided I wanted to like really knuckle down and lose some of the weight, like I lost like from the 150, I lost like 10 or 15 kilos and was kind of just like, like I did that just by eating slightly healthier foods or what I thought were healthier versus the non-healthy at the time. Um, sure. And Obviously, that meant less calories, so I lost a little bit of weight. And then eventually, I was like, oh, it's kind of stalled. I need to pick up some exercise because <clears throat> when you don't really know that much about um, how to lose weight, you think, like, everyone's like, oh, I need to lose weight. I want to join the gym. So I joined a CrossFit gym. Um, and CrossFit, I thought, was a really good initial, um, like, introduction into 
the different, like if I'd gone from, well, I was going from nothing, but if I was going to send somebody else going from nothing into starting a like pretty hectic um, gym routine, I'd probably send them through CrossFit because you have, you know, they deal with strength, they deal with some higher skill movements, some body weight, some gymnastics, some cardio stuff like, so they've got a good mix. And I found from doing that, that I hated the cardio stuff. And I really liked being really strong, like some of the, even like I'd, no, I'd never really done any structured training before. Just being a rugby player gave me um, some decent strength behind me. And uh, like I was walking in and if, every time we did one of the workouts, it was like 30 clean and jerks for time. I was like smashing it. And then as soon as we had to run a mile, I was like walking and hating life. So once I figured out that I liked all the strength stuff, I just focused on that. Um, and initially... I still thought I was doing CrossFit, but really it just ended up being powerlifting. I was just like, yeah, yeah, CrossFit. I skipped some rope and then I did deadlifts and squats and then I skipped some rope again. And I thought I was in CrossFit, but I was just doing powerlifting. Um, and I kind of just got into it like that. There's no real structured way. Um, just my general, like, averagely good strength, um, even for my body weight, like, relatively, it was still averagely good. Um, I then when I moved to the UK, I didn't have a gym for a while. So I decided I would do a marathon. I ran the 2016 London marathon. And as you can imagine, um, a guy my size, it was absolute hell. Um, I don't even know why I did it. I think I was trying to prove something. I, I had friends who had been running a bunch of half marathons. Um, and they kept talking about it. And they just wouldn't shut up about their half marathons and they'd run like 10 or something. And I was like, why don't you just run a full marathon? And they were like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. And I was like, secretly, I just signed up for the London Marathon to try and like get in before they did. Um, and unfortunately for my plan, they also got onto the London Marathon that same year. Um, but they only beat me by like 12 minutes or something like that. So like for people who'd run like all these half marathons and I'd never run more than my fitness test for the um, Air Force, which is 2.4K, um, which was the first I'd ever run until I started marathon training. Um, I thought I did all right. But then once I finished the marathon, I had like three hours a day that I needed to fill. And I could have just gone back to, you know, old bad habits. And I decided that I wanted to put that into getting fitter. And I started <clears throat> started doing some strongman training at a gym in Birmingham in the UK. Um, MSC Performance, a bit of a shout out there. I love those guys. Um, and they... Like, as I was doing the strongman training, we realized that, yeah, I was had a decent level of fitness from rugby, and I was I just finished a marathon, um, but I was also pretty strong. So I did a couple of strongman competitions, um, but really got into powerlifting just because it was something I could do um, at any gym. So, like, when I was traveling around with rugby or going to Europe for sevens or anything like that, I could just maintain that strength training. Um, and then eventually when I left Birmingham and came to... Germany, I was still doing, like, I spent like a couple of months in Australia in between. I still did plenty of um, powerlifting training alongside rugby. And when I got to Germany, I ended up, um, I competed in the, I can't remember what it's called here, but it's basically the GPC, um, which initially I thought I'd done terribly in. And then I realized that it was untested and I was just doing terribly in comparison to the people who were in there because it was untested. I just did GPC because I like to have my feet up, uh, my heels up when I bench. Um, and I basically, like my bench uh, sucks anyway, so I wanted any advantage I could get. Just bring my heels off the ground was just a little bit of advantage that I really enjoyed. Um, and yeah, I ended up, uh, what was my total? I think it was like 6.45 or something um, when I did that. And then they took me to German Nationals and I competed there. And again, going to German Nationals rather than just a local competition, there's even more people who were bigger and stronger and taking more supplements than I was. Um, and yeah, the, like it didn't really go anywhere. Playing rugby and trying to do powerlifting on the side didn't really um, lead to being able to do either optimally. Like I was always injured from rugby, so I had to like stop doing some like powerlifting specific training. And then from powerlifting, I'd be like too sore in the week to be doing like rugby training and it just, they didn't go together that well. You would think they would. I'd probably do it more off-season, um, go hard in powerlifting, and then go hard in rugby again during the on-season. Um, and I guess the way that that has... Like, the biggest thing I got from <clears throat> from powerlifting is that 
being stronger makes everything easier. Like that's one thing I apply with almost all my clients. And I um, did some training with Sebastian Oreb when I was in Australia last. Oh, not last, but when I lived in Australia last. Um, and I've trained with like Eddie Hall and stuff like that. And there's been um, a lot of takeaways from those guys as far as even though like squat, bench, deadlift, overhead press and, and like rowing and stuff like that, even though they're not specific for sports, if you have a generally strong, like those five like core lifts, um, you're probably going to find most things are easier. Like you're going to probably be faster because every step you take is less percentage of your maximum force you could apply. Um, you know, every time I, you know, fend somebody, it's a lot easier for me than somebody who doesn't bench at all. Or, you know, when I'm lifting people in the line outs, like most people I can lift by themselves, uh, by myself. I don't need somebody else there. They just there for stabilization. Um, so like, it's one thing that I've been able to apply to myself <clears throat> and also to other clients. Like when I get like elderly people, um, who are like, yeah, I just want to remain fit and healthy. Like I, when people can move in ways that um, allow them to do powerlifting style programming, I'll program it for them. When they can't, like I just get as close as I can, like try and keep a hip hinge and a squat variation and some sort of pressing, some sort of pulling um, and like use those um, like methods of applying powerlifting training to whatever's appropriate for them. And like now, even now, like I train, I do S&C work with some um, track and field athletes. And I'm still like a bulk of their programming is powerlifting style because again, if they're stronger, everything else is going to be easier. There is a limit with those sort of athletes. So like you want to have a good power to weight ratio and when you start having to put on more muscle size to lift more, it kind of takes away from the specificity of their um, stuff. But the base of their program is still powerlifting style. Yeah, great. And, and some really important points you made there, Nick, because I think the strength and conditioning side of things can be a little bit underrated or perhaps not as exposed with a lot of not only sports-specific athletes, but even you mentioned they have some clients and some elderly clients and you want to improve functionality. Mm -hmm. And incorporating those lifts sometimes is not quite as simple or straightforward as someone would think or they wouldn't perhaps associate those lifts however as we know and as you've stated and explained they can create and generally do create some of the best foundations for these people and again it comes into you know where can you take that with someone depending on their abilities etc and then obviously as you rightly said the specificity so now let's delve into that a little bit further um, you now coach for flat success you, you coach online for them uh, in the main um demographic that you coach is it a, is it a bit of a mixed bag but again you're always sort of putting that strength and conditioning aspect to it or do you have uh, a general niche that you will work with for flex success and do you do any one-on-one -on -one as well or is it purely just online uh so one-on-one -on -one is where i do most of my snc stuff um i didn't actually mention it at the top but i'm level two S and C level two powerlifting level two weightlifting. Like, uh, it's not, these aren't things that I would have recommended just a normal PT. Like a lot, of, like you see all the time, like someone gets their personal training qualification and then the Instagram buyer, they're like, yeah, I'm a strength and conditioning coach. Like they're not the same thing. And it's an important right. thing to, um, like point out okay. is that like there are elements of strength and conditioning that you're not insured to do as a personal trainer. And, um, like vice versa, you can be a strength and conditioning coach and not be a personal trainer and then there's stuff you can't do the other way. Uh, I just happen to be um, because I like learning new stuff and because I always want to make sure that I know what I'm putting out there, um, I go and do the qualifications and stuff like that. But the way that um, I work with Flex is I kind of like, so I don't really specify in like many bodybuilding and stage clients and stuff like that. Um, we have coaches who are really really good at that and even though it is something that i can do and i have done before it's not something like there's i'm more than happy to put my hands up and say i'm not the best at that sort of thing and pass them on to people like alan and dean and dalton who are having you know people doing so so well in 
those fields. Um, with Flex, yeah, powerlifting um, clients, fairly easy to program if they've already got a background in um, powerlifting. I don't really like taking on people and trying to teach them a new skill via online. So like in person, face-to-face, I do a lot more um, S&C style coaching and powerlifting style coaching. But um, yeah, online, it's a, with Flex as well. It's um, you know a lot of people who are you know, sort of general population wanting to lose weight, gain muscle, um, or even like I have people who are already um, doing pretty well in their field. Like I've got uh, one client who is competing at nationals in like seven weeks in weightlifting. Um, I've got another client who I think it's like two weeks now. Um, it might even be nationals. It's a high level powerlifting competition that she's going for as well. Um, so I'm, getting a lot of clients who are at that like higher echelon of athlete, um, but that I don't have to try and uh, teach new skills to via, you know, uh, video calls and emails because it's just not something that like it is doable, but it's such a long process trying to like fix somebody's, like if you're there in person with somebody and you're trying to fix a squat, like rep to rep, I can make changes. If I'm not there in person, like if I'm like following them in their workout, maybe set to set, like if they send me a video in while they're resting, I can maybe make some improvements set to set, but more than likely it's going to be session to session um, that I'll be able to make improvements. And it's just not something that I find is a good um, use of time. Like coaching with good coaches isn't cheap and shouldn't be cheap. And it, like they're better off spending that money on somebody in person, gain that skill acquisition. And then if, um, if they still want to train, like coach with me, like have coaching with me afterwards, then yeah, like once they've gained those skills, it's something I'm more than happy to do. But yeah, with Flex, it's more um, accomplished athletes and general population, like two separate things. And then with um, like my one-on-one clients, it's more strength and conditioning. And I don't really do much gen pop um, one-on-one because again, like, I have a set of skills that mean that people would be paying like more money for like a gen pop trainer than they need to be. And there's better like people that are better suited to that. Whereas I'm, I guess because of that military background and because of that rugby background that I know that like there's a certain amount of stuff that are valid reasons. Um, and there are a certain amount of things that are just excuses. And I find, especially in person, um, I can read that really well in people and I call people out on it a lot. And, you know, like gen pop clients who are, you know, told me that they weren't feeling well, so they ate more food. And I'm just like, the logic behind that is completely upside down. Like people, when they don't feel well, like if you have a stomach bug, you don't eat more food. That's not how it works. Um, so right. like I just call people out on it. And uh, yeah, in person, people don't want to pay the sort of rates that I charge. Um, to be told that they're doing something wrong. You know, people want to be told they're doing all the right things. So I just don't really deal with that sort of client like that. Yeah, great. I like it. Sounds like you've got a pretty straight off, uh, no nonsense style coaching, Nick, which, to be honest, is probably more advantageous and harder to find because, like you said, a lot of, when we use the, the word general population again, it's not really cut out or perhaps needs a little bit of love. It sounds like with like success, it's great because you've got a dynamic where, again, you can segregate between what you specialize in and what you're best at with your skill set and then offset that against your, your peers as well so you can still cover all those bases. Um, mm-hmm. You mentioned at the start as well the strength and conditioning aspect and in terms of the qualification. I think that's a, um, a good topic to bring up because, again, it is different uh, around the world in terms of what the names might be or where you can get qualified uh, you mentioned Mac Nutrition before, Mark McDonald. Uh, I know that is something that's very popular. There's a, there's a few coaches that have invested in that here. Um, and we'll delve into that a little bit more in a bit and we'll talk about nutrition because I, I really, you know, I'm passionate about that and I think it's great to bring up and talk about. Um, I think over in Australia, we have something called Recomp and something that was quite interesting was the definition of fitness, how they perceived it and what most people don't know. So fitness, you know, being uh, without disease. And that's literally it. So if you're not without disease, that's that fitness. And if you said to someone, well, do you just want to be fit? And if that is a defining term, then that's 
probably not what you want, where the strength and conditioning, yeah. as you said, and for the listeners, really does qualify, you know, a coach to take you through those rigorous strength training protocols. So again, a really good one for the listeners. If you are wanting to get some strength and conditioning coaching, make sure that there is a background and there is some sort of uh, qualification and competency uh, within your coach. So a, a great point there, Nick. Um, it's funny that you, sorry to interrupt, it's funny that you bring up recon. Um, I saw something on, I was on social media the other day and it was actually from this Damon that runs Recom, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, I think it was actually from him um, saying that in Australia to do like bodybuilding style coaching, um, you actually aren't insured to do that as a personal trainer um, and that you need to have done an, some additional training on top of your personal training qualification to be able to do that and be insured um, and so, as you say, that is different in different parts of the world. But um, if you're after a certain type of training, you need to make sure that, you know, whoever it is that you're approaching about that style of training actually is qualified and insured to give that style of training. Um, and you know, the insurance side comes, you know, it's more important to the trainer than to the person getting trained because, like, you're covered anyway as the trainee. Um but the trainer needs to make sure that they're staying in their lane, which is a massive problem in the industry at the moment is people, you know, as I said before, they become a personal trainer and put in their bio that they're a strength and conditioning coach and performance nutritionist. And they've done, you know, a weekend course for, I don't know what the personal training companies are like in Australia, but most of the time I find it's like a weekend or two weekends and then all of a sudden they're qualified and can go and, you know, hurt people and, you know, send them backwards. Right. Yeah, this is true. There's definitely a lot of um, clowns out there, uh, for lack of better words, that are, you know, trying to do everything, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. And yeah. unfortunately, I think they're the people that sometimes we're combating against in terms of we're cleaning up the mess. People are coming to us and we've got to create good relationships again. We've got to build new habits and strategies purely based on the fact that someone wanted to advertise themselves as something that they're not without actually getting the proper qualification. But then there's the other side of that where, uh, as we've discussed, the country and the standard, and we, you know, something I, I talk about is we need to raise this industry standard. Um, you know, we don't need to be rocket scientists, but we need to provide a better level of education because the fact of the matter is you can go and do a 12-week course and then all of a sudden you're this TT and you're taking someone to very low body fat levels or putting them under a bar and you don't even know how to squat properly yourself. You don't even understand the basic principles of energy balance. And then these people are getting hurt. And, you know, it just, just to segue really quick, Nick, it's good that you brought up bodybuilding because, you know, people go, you know, it's a sport and it is, it's a culture, it's a way of life. It's whatever you want it to be. You can describe it in many ways. But the fact of the matter is people don't see it as a dangerous sport. They think, you know, like motor racing or rugby, where you can get injured. Well, you mm-hmm. can cause just as much damage physically and mentally uh, if you don't know what you're doing with someone and they can come out of it with eating disorders, you know, um, hormonal imbalances, the works, and yet we get someone who can, again, get this short course and then supposedly take someone to this level and yeah. that's called, you know, physique coaching or, or, or whatever it might be and we need to kind of increase that standard. So we're a really good point there. And to springboard into that, let's talk about what you learned at Mac Nutrition because, again, it is a more prestigious course. It's something that's got better quality of information, from my understanding, from what I've seen from Martin McDonald, etc. Um, can you talk us through what that course was like for you, what you've taken out of it, and then perhaps any other sort of study and, and resources you found helpful within the realms of nutrition for your uh, niche market with, with strength and being conditioning? Yeah, sure. Um, so the way MNU works is it's not just like this is the basics of nutrition Um, because that sort of course is available elsewhere. And, you know, even if it's not at the same level as MNU, like it's a lot of it is, you know, information that is fairly well known, like calorie deficits and how, you know, protein works in the body. But it does go from that biological level um, all the way through to a practical level. Um, MNU has a bunch of extra stuff like, um, you know, how to market yourself afterwards and, you know, how to start a business and stuff like that. But when it actually comes to practical nutrition stuff, like 
I don't even know what that was. Um, we are, when, like when we graduate and we become certified, I am a new certified nutritionist, we're covered to do everything that we learn on the course, including, um, you know, working with people who have more clinical nutrition needs such as PCOS and uh, diabetes and stuff like that. And there's like basically the way Martin has done it is that you can be insured as an MNU certified nutritionist in certain countries. It's in Australia now um, as of fairly recently, but it's in the been in the UK for ages and it's I think it's in the US and it's like a crap ton of countries where you can be insured. Obviously outside of that, you can still practice, um, but then you have to rely on whatever other insurance and what they, what's covered by them, where the MNU policy has like specifically everything we learn on the course. Um, and, you know, being a one year uh, full, like some people it's full online. Um, some people it's online with practical days. Um, so because I'm not that far from the UK, I just flew over for the practical days and did what's called full online with honors. Um, and by doing the full online with honors, I got a bunch of extra stuff, um, which I thought was really helpful, including, you know, some, you know, dealing with clients directly and like how to run those face to face, uh, consultations, which as an online nutritionist, you might think doesn't come in that handy, but actually, um, just ways to deal with people, um, from different backgrounds and coming from different areas and with different conditions, like I said, PCOS and diabetes and, like different things that we do cover on the course. Um, I find that those practical days really put it into perspective. We also do a, um, they call it a body comp uh, residential where they give you calipers, like proper, like the real fancy ones that are like 300 pounds or whatever. It was a lot of money. Um, and yeah. uh, you practice doing it on a bunch of different people and use like, skeletal landmarks and stuff like that to make sure that you're getting, you know, and they assess you to make sure you can measure somebody's body fat um, multiple times and get within a range, like a very small range um, of accuracy. And then same with using on different people with different body types. Um, so the practical stuff is really, really helpful um, that they give you on MNU that they don't really give you on other courses, especially like, I don't, know, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but in the UK, there's a bunch of like weekend courses where you, know, you go for two days, you watch some PowerPoint slides, and all of a sudden you're able to call yourself a nutritionist, um, which they don't tell anyone who signs up for those courses, but anyone can call themselves a nutritionist. Um, in, well, in the UK anyway, it's not a protected title. Um, so that's why they make the differentiation to MNU certified nutritionist with or without honours, depending on whether you did the honours side or not. Um, but yeah, it literally like takes you through sports nutrition, working with obese population, um, nutrition considerations for endurance athletes, uh, bodybuilding, like it, literally anything that you can think of within the nutrition industry that doesn't require an additional um, training or degree. Like, so we can't really deal with people who have um, eating disorders, um, but we can deal with them alongside a like psychologist or something like that. So where we're not dealing with the actual mental health side of things, um, but with the guidance of a psychologist can work with them to whatever capacity um, they say is like suitable. So for example, somebody might like a, a somebody psychologist or like they have food therapists now, um, but they might be like, yeah, this person shouldn't be dieting at all. So we just don't work with them. Some people are like, yeah, this person can handle some healthy eating habits, but shouldn't track anything and shouldn't be given targets and shouldn't weigh themselves or like whatever the, um, the criteria is given, um, we're able to work alongside a suitable medical professional, um, with a lot of things that we aren't trained in through MNU as well. Um, so yeah, there's like the variety of stuff that you learn on that course is sometimes astounding. Like I went in with a pretty good knowledge of nutrition and so there was obviously some topics that I found um, fairly easy. I scored really well on. And then uh, there were other things like, you know, with my background in uh, the military and in rugby and stuff like that, like maybe um, going into it, I thought my people skills were a bit better than um, they were assessed to be. But it's all like extra strings to my bow. Like it's more stuff that I can now um, use and apply. And I've definitely become a better, more well-rounded nutritionist um, 
because of MNU. Um, and not only that, I've like without MNU, I wouldn't have got my job uh, with Flex, and I wouldn't have met a bunch of people in the industry who I'm now proud to call friends. And um, you know, there's uh, so much stuff that came with it other than the qualification that I never thought I would get out of it. Like I almost didn't do the practical days because I was like, who cares? Like I'm never going to see these people again, but actually um, I've made some really good friends on the course and, you know, some decent contacts in the industry, like the way that Martin gets his um, conferences or he calls them live days because he, I mean, he doesn't want to call them a conference for some reason. Maybe it's a legal thing. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Whatever. Um, but the way Martin gets his live days and organizes them and brings guests over, usually from like the US, but they're always leaders in their field. And um, he kind of vets them personally. Like he knows whether someone is a decent person or not before he brings them over. And, you know, you end up being friends with, like I say, friends, like Facebook friends, that's official, right? <laughs> um, with people like James Krieger and Spencer Nadalski and stuff like that. And, um, you know, when people graduate, I mean, you, they have those sort of people commenting, you know, well done, congratulations and that, like on their personal Facebook post. And like, you know, it's just people in the industry that um, we wouldn't have been exposed to for not having done MNU um, that are, you know, leaders in the industry. Like James Krieger has his uh, research review that's really good, like weightology. Um, and then like Spencer Nadolsky is not just, you know, coming from that nutrition point of view, he's also coming from the point of view as an actual medical doctor and like a bunch of points of view that you don't really learn on MNU because obviously they're not teaching doctors and they don't have heaps of doctors coming in and doing lectures and stuff. Um, but they can uh, take away from your time in MNU that isn't part of the curriculum, but is actually like some of the bigger takeaways is these extra points of view because of the live days and stuff like that. Right. Now, thank you for sharing in detail, Nick, because I think that's one of the, the courses there's, there's a few out there and obviously Martin McDonald and with again as you rightly said key people in the industry or what we call the good guys if you like you know your um, James Krieger's your Danny Lennon your Eric Helm these guys it's really important for people to even if someone now the name drop and they go and have a look at the, these people they might actually go oh wow you know what this is good and perhaps what I'm doing is not quite right or perhaps that I can be working to a better standard and as you rightly said, there's always, there's always more to learn. Um, it sounds like it was a very valuable course for yourself. What, uh, for, for the people listening uh, that are, you know, want, want to have access or perhaps want to check it out, and I'll, and I'll put a link in the description, but in terms of time frames, I understand that obviously that can be up to you to a degree to, to get it done from what I've spoke to my peers about. But um, time frames and cost, can you give us a bit of an, an, an average for people listening that might want to be interested in that? Yeah, so time frame wise, um, it's supposed to be 12 months. There is an option to extend it um, for certain people. Like if you're like different people have like whatever come up. So if like something comes up around the course, they let you extend it. Um, if you're getting towards the exam period and you don't feel confident um, in taking the exams, you can take an extension because the idea isn't that um, people just pass MNU. Like the failure rate is pretty high for this type of course like for something where people pay and they do it all online or mostly online depending on how you did it but um the failure rate sorry there's a garbage truck outside my window um right. the, failure, the failure rate on um the course is pretty high uh, and that is because they um actually require you to come away with a certain amount of knowledge and a certain amount of skills from the course and if you don't have that they just don't pass you so they give you the option to extend if um, you don't feel ready for the exams. They give you an option to extend um, so you can have longer studying. Um, if you fail the exams, they give you um, a reset, um, maybe, and or an option to extend. Um, I don't know, did fail. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's um, options there to extend it and kind of do it in your own time. I know there's one guy in the industry, I uh, won't name his name, but... Um, he signed up MNU, started getting a lot of traction. Um, and so in the end, still, um, it's almost 
he was on like two intakes before me. So um, he probably should have graduated a year ago, but he's still doing it at his own pace um, just because he kind of took off and like to manage a business that's growing the size of his at the rate his is going. He just doesn't have the time to do M&U as well. Um, so they're really flexible. I like, I'd be remiss if I didn't say something about the stuff. Like Martin's great and Martin's funny and, you know, he's the face of the brand and stuff. But like Sarah, um, Sarah Duffield, she is pretty much the, like, so Martin's the face of it, but nothing will get done without her. Um, and then the staff that he has on board, uh, incredible. Like if you go to these live days, if you go to the um, residentials as part of the full with honours, um, you really get the most out of MNU by having access to the other staff that he has on board who are all, I'm pretty sure they're all masters um, qualified or studying their masters at the moment. Um, and yeah, so it's not just Martin and Martin's point of view, there's a team behind it. So it's not like, obviously it was just Martin and Martin's point of view, there's potential for bias in there, but he has really good people around him who tend to keep him pretty grounded and, um, you know, keep him in check. And it's, so it's not just the Martin McDonald show, like it's it really is M and U and it's its own thing. And, um, yeah, like as far as timelines go and keeping you on board with like, you know, your study plan, like if you fall behind by a couple of lectures, they email you and they're like, is everything okay? Like, do you need some help with anything? Um, and, you know, I, when I started working with Flex, I was working for the first month, I was working both with Flex and my old job. And um, so I fell behind on MNU and then just getting in touch with me, asking like if everything's all right. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm just like this month, I don't have time for it, but I'll get back on it. And they offered the study plan and like, let me know about extensions and stuff. Um, as far as cost, I know that it goes up every intake. Um, well, maybe not every intake, but when I initially looked at signing up, it was cheaper than when I did sign up. Um, there are payment plans, so you can pay off monthly while you're doing m and um, but I'm not sure how much it is in total at the moment. Um, there's no discount for paying up front, um, but when you pay up front, you get extra stuff like, um, I think it's free tickets to like the live days that happen while you're a student stuff like that so um yeah there is a payment plan we can pay monthly it makes it a little bit more achievable for people and if you can afford to pay up front yeah you get that those extra couple of bonuses which don't make it like the course any easier but they do um you know add a little bit of value there because it's not fair like the way martin puts it is it's not fair that just because you couldn't afford enough front payment that um you should have to pay more so that's the way they run it yeah, great. And and very refreshing to hear, you know, the standard. Uh, I've heard nothing but good things about the uh, Mac Nutrition. And, and again, I'm a bit of a fan of Martin McDonald. The followers work uh, fairly closely. So for those people watching, please uh, please check that out if you're interested. Uh, Nick, to, to carry on the theme of nutrition, we talked off camera a little bit about uh, nutrition in terms of plant-based or vegetarian, vegan-based athletes. Can you talk us through a little bit more uh, about some protocols, some strategies, some procedures, um, how you coach people online with that, some of the dynamics uh, and perhaps some like real life examples as well that you, you're willing to share with us. Yeah, of course. Um, so when it comes to like a plant-based diet or even a vegetarian diet to some extent, so like the difference there for people who don't know. Um, so obviously most people in the world will eat meat, dairy, eggs, vegetables well some people might not eat vegetables um some people might not eat any of that if they have a terrible diet but in general they're not opposed to eating those things um and then you have a couple of levels um of what's the best word? of restriction but a self-imposed restriction it's not um due to allergies or anything like that and um so it generally goes like um pescatarian where people will still consume fish but they won't consume meat outside of that and they still consume dairy and sometimes eggs um and then after that you've got vegetarian where people will still consume um dairy again sometimes eggs depending on their um yeah some people just for some reason some vegetarians don't like eggs even though they have no 
um, issues with them. Um, and then after vegetarianism, you then have uh, vegan, which is completely plant-based. So consuming no um, meat or dairy or fish or anything that comes from animals. Um, and there is something which, uh, so I would consider plant-based to be kind of between vegetarian and vegan. I believe if you're following a plant-based diet, it is primarily plants, um, but it's not as restrictive as like a full vegan diet. Um, and like it can be, if you want it to be, like it can be absolutely no animal products um, and maybe just not come with the ethical side of veganism but vegan isn't so much like it is about not eating and not consuming um animal products but it's also like about sustainable um and ethical everything like where do you get your shower products from um needs to be ethical like to call yourself a vegan so um it's kind of getting past diet but if we just talk about in the, this circumstance vegan as just diet like no um, animal products it's probably just the best way to use that word in this instance um, but yeah so obviously when you get away from eating more animal products um, people always say where do you eat protein from isn't it hard to get protein it's not um, protein is just different so animal protein contains all the uh, essential amino acids in different ratios, but they have to meet a certain standard to be co considered complete protein. Um, for example, pea protein um, does contain all amino acids, but it doesn't contain enough the thionine to be considered complete. Um, and to get enough, you would have to eat way more than whatever. But um, so when you're vegetarian, you still have options like eggs are still complete protein, dairy is still complete protein, Whey is technically dairy, um, and it's just a byproduct of cheese production. So for when people, I always hear, like, because I work with non-plant-based, um, non-vegan, non-vegetarian clients all the time, um, but people are like, oh, I don't want to eat any processed foods, so I don't want to have whey. And I'm like, do you eat cheese? Yeah. Well, then you can eat whey because it's the exact same thing. Like, I don't even consider it a supplement anymore. It is just a food. Um, it's no different to cheese consumption. Um, but because of that, it is a complete protein. It's also the gold standard <clears throat> of protein. So when you are um, like, there's sort of like ratings of um, protein and how bioavailable it is and how complete it is and weighs the gold standard, like that is one. And then stuff might be like 0.8 compared to whey and stuff it's like this. A couple of things that are uh, overweight, like more bioavailable and more complete and stuff but there's they're not that common and especially not in the context that we're talking about so vegetarians can still consume whey and can still uh, can still consume dairy so they don't really have much of an issue getting complete proteins um some people might use it and excuse me like oh my protein's really low because i'm a vegetarian like just consume more dairy like um if you are tolerant to it and you don't have an issue there like if you really don't want to consume like whole dairy, you can consume whey protein. Like it's no different to having, you know, meat and stuff. It just doesn't cons consume the same amount of like vitamins and minerals, but you weren't consuming it anyway. So increase your protein intake like that. If you're then plant-based, vegan, like somewhere where you're consuming less or no dairy, um, then your protein considerations are more important um, because Legumes, for example, don't contain enough of all the amino acids to be complete. Um, they're also not as bioavailable um, as whey protein. And then again, your other forms of protein, like most fruit and veg is like 5% protein. Um, grains are a pretty good source of protein. Um, like nuts and seeds are pretty good sources of protein. But the problem with the problem I find with um, vegan sources of protein is they're not very often isolated. So um, as a big dude who follows a plant-based lifestyle, I try not to um, divert from that too much. Like every now, like if I go to someone's house and they're like, oh, do you want some of this 
delicious apple pie my grandma made, I'm not going to be like, no, nah, fuck you. That's got dairy in it. Like, I'm just going to eat the pie and shut up. <laughs> um, like, I'm not a dickhead about it. Um, I, so that's why, that's another reason why I consider myself plant-based and not um, fully vegan. Um, but I still can have to consider like where I'm getting protein from and like because I'm, I'm larger than the average bear, I have a higher protein consideration like a pro- protein requirement than um, somebody of a smaller size. Um, and by having like getting it from nuts, like um, Spencer Nadolsky put something on his Instagram a while ago, like getting, yeah, eating peanut butter um, for protein is like drinking martinis to get olives. Like it's just not a good way of going about it. Um, so yeah, these things do contain proteins. Um, but for me, I rely on a lot, a lot on um vegan protein shakes so you always a blend and i'll go into why in a second um like a vegan protein blend and then outside of that i just eat more legumes and stuff than i used to like instead of having like where i used to have maybe like chicken and rice i'll now have lentils because it already contains carbohydrates and already contains protein um and that is the easiest way for me um to maintain like relatively okay body composition like i like to say that i'm kind of fat but also kind of big so it works its way out like i'm not the leanest guy getting around but i also don't really care about being lean that much um you know i play rugby i want a bit of padding when someone runs into me um and yeah so by just choosing smarter options and putting more emphasis on protein as you can tell because that's all i've talked about since you asked me this question um It means that I can um, make smarter decisions when choosing options and can therefore um, like maintain body composition, maintain performance just with, um, yeah, choosing the right types of foods. And so I mentioned the protein blend. The reason why I use a blend is because as we've discovered through my like 10 minutes of ranting about this already, um, the legume protein isn't complete grain protein isn't complete but um where legumes are high in like leucine and lysine um but they're like and you know they've got uh, all the other um or some legumes have all the other uh, essential amino acids but maybe not enough of them you combine that with something like um rice oats wheat like these even though the protein percentage in them is small if you isolate the protein in that obviously then becomes larger Um, and they're high in methionine, which is what most of the legumes are lacking in. So by combining them, you're getting a more complete protein and it is then considered complete. It's not a bioavailable though. So for me, like if I was eating a normal, like omnivorous diet and consuming lots of animal protein, um, I would probably put myself at around 200, 220 grams of protein a day. Like for me, as I said before, I'm like between 105, 110. So somewhere around there would probably be enough for me to gain muscle, lose fat, like all the good stuff. Like I don't really change protein that much. Um, and then going vegetarian, I'd probably increase that to like between 230, 250 grams a day um, just because I'd be getting less animal sources and more um, vegetable sources. And then... Um, going vegan, I pretty much increase it to like anywhere between 260 and 300 grams a day, um, purely based on bioavailability. Even if I went for soy, which um, I didn't mention before, but is a complete protein, um, even if I went for that for all of my protein requirements, it's still around two thirds as bioavailable as whey. So then straight away, using like soy as a one for one swap, I would need to consume another third extra. So just to play it safe, I eat more protein than normal. Um, so like, so what if I've got a bit more protein that's, um, getting, you know, put through whatever process, like it might be going, might not be getting used for MPS, but it might have muscle protein synthesis. It might not be getting used for that. Um, but it might be getting used by other organs in my body or for other tissues in my body. Like you've got to remember when we're talking about protein, it's not just there for muscles. Like if you only ever consumed, 
proteins that your muscles use in the exact form that they use them and your muscles got preference, then other parts of your body would deteriorate. So I'm happy to have a bit extra, make sure I'm covering all the bases. Um, and then, yeah, like just by combining those proteins, either in a shake and using the isolated forms or consuming, like if I have lentils, I might make Satan, which is um, just basically made from wheat gluten, um, which is just a protein in gluten, uh, sorry, in wheat, which is obviously a grain protein. Um, by combining, you know, instead of having chicken and rice, having Satan and um, lentils, it's kind of the same sort of meal and it completes a protein profile and kind of gets me out of pretty much any sticky situation I might get in with protein and not eating animal products. Um, and that's, yeah, outside of those protein considerations, um, there's not really that much difference between, you know, whether you consume animal products or not. Like if you're, there's no restriction on carbohydrate. I don't think any carbs come from animals, right? I haven't encountered one that does. Um, <clears throat> and fat wise, like, yeah, you're probably consuming less fat from a non-animal, non-animal product based diet, um, whether that's fully plant based or not. Um, but you, if you find that you're going under on your fat intake and it's causing health issues or um, anything like that, you can, if depending on your reasons for like choosing that sort of lifestyle, like I know people who still consume some oily fish every two weeks, every month, just to maintain, you know, the vitamins and stuff that they get from that. You can supplement with those things, but again, bioavailability becomes an issue because like D3 you would get from, um, I think it's lanolin, no, not lanolin, that's a non-vegan version, but there's a D3 version that's not, um, doesn't come from animals, not as bioavailable. Um, again, with uh, Amigas, like the vegan version of that is through algae. Again, not as bioavailable. There's more ALA and less DHA, EPA. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm getting all dried out from just talking and talking and talking. Um, basically, though, um, that might sound like that you have to combine all these things. If you don't have a performance goal or you don't have a, you know, you're not trying to gain heaps of muscle or anything like that, you can just have a varied amount, like a varied um, source of protein throughout the day and you'll probably be sorted. Like these things don't have to be combined in the same meal. I just do it for me because I find that if I'm concentrating on it as, at a per meal um, like basis because of my goals and stuff, I just don't miss anything out. If I wasn't like didn't have those considerations, I'd just be like, yeah, at some point during the day, I want to consume some legume protein. And at some point during the day, I want to consume some grain protein and maybe some seasoned nuts somewhere. And I would probably end up getting enough if I was making smart choices with those, like, you know, just consuming more higher protein foods. Mm, yeah. Now, you, you answered some really, really popular frequently asked questions, Nick. So I'm glad you went on that rant. Uh, firstly, thank you for defining the terms and the categories because I think a lot of people get confused upon those. And I know something back when I was studying, it seems, especially in this day and age, people are very, you know, pick and choosy. And it's almost like you create your own all these days. You know, you're a pescatarian, but then you'll sometimes have a burger. And someone's mm -hmm. vegan, but then they'll add in, they'll have a steak. It's like, okay, great. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I think uh, it's good if you can do that in terms of you use an example go around to someone's house or after you an apple pie or something. And if again, as long as it doesn't cause you, you know, any harm, you've not got actually any deficiencies or any allergies, again, eat, eat the food and that does lead on to, you know, the the true element of being flexible with your nutrition, which is perhaps another niche topic. But I know working with a lot of vegan, vegetarian and plant based um, athletes myself, the common question which you answered really well was, you know, what how can I get more protein? How can I get more protein? And I think a good point you made is one, you know, if, again, depending on what category, dairy, increasing the dairy and looking at the tolerance. But then also, um, you did well explaining the differences in the bioavailability of um, different food groups, but also the combinations, because that's something that 
um, you know, I had to learn as well, for example, you know, perhaps combining it to your brown rice with your black beans to create, you know, a more, a more bioavailable, more complete protein, especially mm-hmm. for the more strength-based athletes. So thank you for going over that. That was really good. And can you, because I'm apprehending some questions here from the audience, perhaps give us an example of a typical, you did a little bit, uh, uh, what's a typical day look like uh, for you, Nick? Again, being someone who's larger, probably has a higher protein requirement, um, and again, is someone who is uh, involved in strength and conditioning, you know, powerlifting, lifting heavyweights, and then also as a coach. Can you give us a bit of a run-through from sort of start, finish, breakfast to dinner? Yeah, of course. Um, so one thing that is individual to me and one thing I um, that needs to be considered is because I have um, gone from such a high body weight to what is now a normal-ish body weight um, for me, there is a certain amount of um, like metabolic adaption or adaptive thermogenesis that I've tried to reverse um, – but I'm just never going to be at the top range of calorie intake. Like <clears throat> where somebody like, you know, you see hard gainers who can pretty much eat anything and not put on weight. I'm at the bottom end of the range. So if I eat, you know, too close to, um, well, even just a little bit over what would be considered my calculated maintenance, it tends to be an actual surplus for me. Um, so I have to watch my calorie intake. So trying to get in, 300 grams of plant-based protein um, while still watching my calorie intake can be a bit difficult. So I usually start the day and finish the day um, with a plant-based protein shake and usually either my pre or post-workout protein will be a protein shake. So to get that out of the way, I do consume a lot more protein shakes than most people. But for those reasons, like I need to get in um, lower calorie protein so that I have room through other parts of the day to have um, legumes and stuff like that. So usually it's breakfast, protein shake, maybe some fruit. Um, And depending on when I train, like now, these days I train around midday um, because more flexible with uh, working with flex, you know, flex, flexible, you know, kind of comes hand in hand. Um, But yeah, so... Now that I train around midday, I kind of have a pre-workout meal, which will either be, um, depending on how much time I've got or how busy I am, a protein shake and like a carb source, like, you know, rice cakes or, um, you know, something, you know, sandwich, like something not too complicated. Um, Or it'll be like a meal before and then I'll have that meal, like the sandwich and protein shake after, depending on time-wise. So around training either pre or post workout i'll have something that's probably like rice and um satan or something like that just to try and get in carbs that aren't crazy high in fiber because i try and avoid that around training otherwise i basically just fight myself around the gym and everyone has to leave um because like that is one consideration with a plant-based diet is uh you will fart a whole lot more luckily for me i find farts hilarious uh, my girlfriend doesn't find them hilarious. Well, nowhere near as hilarious as I do. Um, but, um, yeah, so around there, I'm probably having some rice, maybe like an extra protein shake. It just depends on what's available and how much time I have. Um, oats is another good one um, around training. And then, like, away from training, so whether I train early or train late, they're the sort of meals I have around the training. So, like, easy to digest proteins and carbohydrates, um, so sandwiches, um, protein shakes, rice, that sort of thing. And away from training, I'm having um, more high fiber meals. So I'm having a lot of, like I mentioned before, uh, lentils and Satan because that's a nice mix in the same meal um, where I can get the complete protein. Um, but also, this tastes pretty good. Like, once you get used to it, having lentils instead of rice is pretty easy. And having um, Satan instead of whatever meat you're having before, like, if you get, like, once you get good at cooking, and that's one thing. When I stopped eating um, animal products, I got way better at cooking because I had to. Um, But yeah, so um, having those higher fiber meals away from training, like the higher, like lentils, beans, whatever. Um, And I'll probably have some tofu at some point, like one of my meals. Like I'm probably around five meals a day. Um, 
and that's not because I'm trying to stoke my metabolism. It's just hard to eat that many lentils in one sitting. Like there's been, when I first like stopped eating animal products, I would be like, yeah, for dinner, I'll just have like 400 grams of lentils. And then I'd just be writhing all night in pain and like just unable to sleep properly because my guts are just going nuts. Um, so yeah, like trying to space those high fiber foods out throughout the day is kind of important as well. Um, so yeah, to, to summarize it, I'd probably go protein shake, um, like pre-workout meal, post-workout meal, which will consist of those easy to digest proteins and carbs. Um, and then afterwards I'm probably going to like lentils and seitan. And then afterwards I'm probably going to like tofu and veggies, maybe some rice in there if I really want it. Um, if I don't know if you guys have it that much in um, Australia, but the other version of tofu, so tofu is like processed and fermented soybeans. Um, but if you can get, oh, what's it even called? Now that I've started talking about it, I've forgotten what it's called. But basically, it's um, soybeans that have been have like mold textures put on them, and then they're like left to go moldy. And it sounds real gross. Um, but the actual texture of something that's name I've forgotten. Um, I'm going to Google it real quick because that's going to annoy me. Mm, go for it. Um, what do you search for that? Moldy soybeans? I'll come up some interesting channel. Um, how does that not even come up? Anyway, I'm going to keep It's not that. like the meat, meat substitute. No, nah, most meat substitutes are um, they are soy based, but they're not. Um, they're not, not the thing you're thinking of. Yeah, like because they're like they're processed soy based. Um, they're not like an actual because it's still technically a whole food because it's just like whole beans and then like mixed with um, mold. And it sounds super gross, so I really need to find out what it is before people start going. Oh, this guy eats mold. Um, why can't I find it? Normally, all I can find is um, tempeh. It's called tempeh. Everyone, stop the trains. It's tempeh. Um, so tempeh, yeah, really nice, really texturous. Still technically whole food because it's not really processed. It's just soybeans and mold, um, which sounds really gross, like what you said. Um, but yeah, that's something I will have um, maybe in place of. Um, Tofu, I'm getting in a bunch of soy milk because higher protein, not that high in calories. So like, you know, where I, where I need to top up a meal with some protein, I'll get some soy milk in there. Um, soy yogurts as well. A lot of soy, um, which some people think is an issue, but actually if you look at the research, isn't an issue. And I haven't grown tits yet. So I feel like, you know, with the amount of soy I eat, if it was going to be an issue, I would be having the issue um so it's just not something that i think needs to be worried about um in like normal dosages like if all you ate was soy protein then you might have an issue but as far as the research is concerned there are no issues um and then finish it off with a protein shake so i got distracted in the middle there by tempeh but yeah basically around training I keep it pretty simple and easy to digest and away from training, I eat, you know, more fibrous foods that may be less easy to digest depending on, depending on your like individual tolerance to fiber. Yeah, no, I appreciate the rundown. It's always good for people listening to just, even like you said, the caveat that it's not about copying or having the same intake, but it just gives people ideas and people always like that um, perspective. I guess that's something that I forgot to reiterate before is the fact that you can generally, as someone who eats more, as my friend would put it, plant centric, um, incorporate a higher protein intake, which can actually be uh, a strategy which you can implement perhaps for people that, you know, want to increase satiability or actual food volume. But then on the opposite side of that, which you brought up, which is really important. And I think not just plant based, um, people who follow plant-based uh, nutrition regimes, but even people who don't, fiber. Fiber is a huge one. Most people, they are over-consuming fiber because they're eating, quote-unquote, clean. 
um, mm-hmm. and they think, you know, oh, yeah, I've got to get all this in, or perhaps people like hard gain and struggle to get the calories in, you're like, well, no wonder, dude, because, you know, all your calories are coming from, like, oats <laughs> and brown rice, yeah. and like you said, it, it causes um, a lot of gastrointestinal issues, and obviously, like you said, with the plant-based intake, something you've got to realize, I have the privilege <laughs> to know a few athletes that uh, are plant-based, some of which I work with, and yes, yeah, they... They definitely use the old gas pipe to get them off out the squats, if you know what I mean. And um, yeah, it can be comical, but um, sometimes it can become a bit of an issue as well. So an important caveat, I think, to bring up as well, just, just for people to realize, and like yourself, I do find it quite quite funny and entertaining. Um, Nick, but before we wrap it up, because I'm um, sensitive on time and I I'm, I'm appreciate uh, what you've shared so far, I have a couple of questions, uh, a little bit less serious that I want to go through with you before our final question. So with these ones, answer them as honestly as you can. You don't have to give them too much thought. They're a bit fun. They're a bit lighthearted. Uh, the first one would be, if you could wake up anywhere in the world tomorrow, where would where would it be and why? Ooh, that is a very good question. I feel like I should have prepared for these. Um, if I could wake up anywhere... Yeah, um, it has to be in the world. It, ooh, that's that's a good little that's a good caveat. Yeah, in this scenario, it has to be in the world. So I'm guessing you would go to another planet otherwise. Yeah, how cool would that be? Um, that would be also, doesn't it take like a crazy amount of time to get to another planet? So if we could just wake up there, that'd be awesome. Um, if I could wake up anywhere, I reckon inside a bank vault with an escape route. Now, that is probably one of the best answers I've had today. I like the way you think. Yeah, well, once I got all the monies out of the, out of the bank vault, I could go anywhere, right? So maybe yeah, exactly. even invent a teleportation machine so I could always wake up anywhere I wanted. And then live on Mars. Yeah, I just have to I'd pay somebody else to take the other end of the teleportation machine there. I imagine that's how teleportation would work, is you have two machines, like in The Simpsons, and you walk in one and walk out the other. Um, yeah, so someone would have to take the other one to Mars for me. But yeah, then then I would totally wake up on Mars whenever I wanted. Absolutely. I like it. If you were an animal, what animal would you be? Um, I would say probably gorilla. Probably pretty good. Um, yeah, pretty good, like, commonalities between me and the gorilla. Like... We don't eat meat. We like to be muscly. I guess they don't really do weights, like lift weights, but um, they lift themselves into trees, so they kind of do some resistance training. <clears throat> um, and, you know, they're pretty peaceful creatures, but I wouldn't want to fuck with one. <laughs> like, they would, yeah. That's probably my my most, like, uh, animal that I have <clears throat> stuff in common with. And then I guess, like, what would I like to be? Um, oh, can it, does it have to be a real life animal today? Can it be extinct? Go on. A lot, you, you're always trying to get out of the, the break the question, live outside yeah. the rules. I like it. All right, go on. Give, give us that. Um, I'd like to be a dinosaur, preferably one that flies. That'd be cool. Like a pterodactyl. That'd be awesome. Yeah, um, that's pretty ferocious, man. That was definitely one of the, the best dinosaur picks back in the day when I was young. You know, <laughs> when you used to play, what dinosaur would you be? <laughs> and um, the third rapid fire question, or the fun based question, is do you think there is anything after life when we pass, when we die, do you think that's it? It's game over? Or do you think there's perhaps something more? There's another realm. Um, good question. I think that you get recycled and <clears throat> come back in like this world. I feel like there's, so yeah, there's a couple of ways that in my mind that it could work. Um, but that one is probably the most, I say realistic. None of them are very realistic. My mind is a crazy place. Um, but <clears throat> if, I think the most realistic would be that our whatever essence thing gets recycled um, into another 
being of whatever. And then I guess then what being would it be? Probably depends on how good you live the life that you're in and like whether you deserve an upgrade or a downgrade. Um, and then like most dogs probably come back as people because that would be an upgrade, right? Um, yeah. But then I think there's probably room for like another realm, but then is, are there ways to travel to it without dying would be like my initial question. Like, is it another realm that exists in the same time and just is parallel to this one? Or is it another realm that's like end to end? Like you have to pass through this one to get to the next one. Um, and yeah, then it just starts to boggle my brain with all the questions I come up with. So let's just go with there's the one realm that we're in and it doesn't just end. You just get to live another life as something else or someone else. Mm. I think perhaps um, some questions and answers quantum physics is trying to explore <laughs> or has explored, but it's good. we need these eccentric minds to make I like it. And my final question, which is a bit more serious and, and one that I ask for my guests, and it doesn't have to be related to what we've talked about today. It could be anything, anything else. And it's, can you identify uh, a fear that you've had in your life, Nick, or a, a major fear that you had to overcome? What was it? And what did you learn from overcoming this fear? Yeah. Um, so when I was a little bit younger, not like a kid, um, like I never had a traditional fear of like spiders or snakes or anything like that. Like you can't have that if you're an Aussie. Otherwise, you just live in fear. Um, but my, <laughs> my nan died of Alzheimer's. And mm -hmm. uh, one thing that got to me when, like, before she died was that um, she forgot who I was. And after that, I just hated the thought of being forgotten. Um, and then, like, kind of, like, then manifested into hating being ignored and like I just had this like paranoia that I was like going to go through everything and then just be forgotten at the end anyway um and so I guess I had a fear of being forgotten but then now I kind of just like the way I got through that was I just don't really care too much about what other people think like if I get through and like I've achieved something and I'm happy with that like that's far more important than whether somebody remembers, you know, whatever. Like chances are because of the hereditary nature of um, Alzheimer's, I will probably forget what I did anyway. So I won't even remember if I've been forgotten. Um, so yeah, like that was my fear that I've kind of overcome. Um, and how did I do it? I just stopped really giving a shit what other people think. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter. Like, as long as I'm happy with what I'm doing, um, that's all that I can really aim for. Like, I can't control what other people think of me, how other people remember me, anything like that, but I can control how I think about myself and how I, um, you know, feel about, you know, when I get to the end, if I can remember anything, how I lived it, will I be happy with that? I think the way that I do things and the decisions I make, that I will be happy with it. Mm. Thanks for sharing. I think a good takeaway. I think that's a good mindset for most of us to adopt. Definitely easier said than done. And before we sign off, Nick, where can people find more about you, uh, what you do, your work, and if they're interested in getting some coaching, where's the best place to connect? Yeah. Um, so I am on social media. Uh, so I'm on Instagram as at coach.big.nick. Um, you can obviously get in touch with me via Flex Success, so flexsuccess.com.au or at flex underscore success on Instagram. Um, we're also on Facebook. I think it's like facebook.com forward slash success with FS. Um, <clears throat> if I've remembered that, that's amazing. I should get a raise. Um, uh, other than that, um, you know, if you wanted to coach with me, best way to go is through Flex Success. Um, as I don't really take on, well, I don't take on any online clients outside of that. If you somehow live in Germany um, and wanted to contact me, just go through Instagram. Um, and then for anything else, like to talk about multi-dimension theories and what happens after we die, if you just want to have those conversations, also Instagram. Yeah, and perhaps that's going to be the part two to this podcast <laughs> <laughs> when we expand. Um, 
and as always i'll put those links uh, in the in the show notes below and nick thank you once again for your time i've really enjoyed the chat it's been different it's been comical it's been valuable i think you raised some very important uh, topics you've answered some popular questions as well and i know the viewers would have got a lot of out of this, especially obviously the spoke to our industry. So thank you once again, my friend. I appreciate it. No problem, man. Thank you very much for having me on. Absolutely. My pleasure. And guys, thank you all for tuning in. Remember to subscribe on your favorite media platform, whatever that might be. And as always, we'll be back next week with another guest. So as always, in the meantime, stay fearless.